for the Apostle Paul, take away the resurrection, you take away Christianity. Why is the resurrection so important to Christianity? Well, let me ask it another way. Is it conceivable, remotely conceivable, that we could have a meaningful Christian faith apart from resurrection? Again, in our day, there are theologians who are arguing that the resurrection of his historical event is not necessary for a meaningful Christian faith. Paul, of course, had a different view. The whole 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians argues in what we would call ad hominem fashion. He's faced with a problem in the Corinthian community that some people were denying the reality of resurrection. And so what Paul does masterfully in 1 Corinthians 15 is two things. In the first place, he gives us a detailed argument for the resurrection based upon the fulfillment of Scripture, the eyewitness testimony of the apostles, of the 500 people, and of his own eyewitness experience. But then he argues ad hominem. He said, all right, let's take your argument for a minute. Suppose there is no resurrection of the dead. If A, what follows? What's the result of that? Let's take your thinking to its logical conclusion. If Christ is dead and there is no resurrection from the dead, then what are the implications of that? And he spells them out. The implications are what? You're still in your sins. Your faith is in vain. Your faith is useless. Your preaching is futile. You become false witnesses of God because you're telling everybody that God did in fact raise him from the dead. Not only that, but there are other personal shattering implications that those who have fallen asleep in the Lord have perished. Your loved ones that have died, you have no hope for them. And then he gets, you know, he's mad. He says, why do I fight with a wild beast at Ephesus? You know, why am I sacrificed every day? You think I'm doing this for my health? And he protests about it and then said, but now is Christ raised from the dead and doesn't leave us with just the negative implications of a non-resurrection. But again, the point is that for the Apostle Paul, take away the resurrection, you take away Christianity. He said, if Christ is not raised, we are of all people the most to be pitied. And we might as well embrace the creed of the Epicurean, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But the positive significance is that the greatest enemy of man, that enemy that hangs over every human being like the sword of Damocles every day of our lives, the ultimacy of our own personal death, which threatens everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we learn with ultimate chaos, with what the existentialist calls the abyss of non-being, of annihilation. That enemy is conquered by the resurrection because the resurrection is not seen in the New Testament as an isolated event simply for the benefit of Jesus. But the New Testament declares that his resurrection is as the first fruits of those who have died so that we are promised that we will participate in the resurrection of Jesus. Welcome back to Narrow Path Doctrine. My name is Jim. Going to focus this time around on the doctrine of the resurrection. Very important doctrine, of course. The resurrection is central to our hope as believers. It speaks not only of Christ's victory over death, but also of our future bodily resurrection. We're going to break this down into three points here today. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, the first fruits of our resurrection. The resurrection of believers, our future hope. And the implications of the resurrection for our lives today. Now, the foundation of the Christian faith is the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without this event, our faith would be in vain. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Jesus' resurrection is significant because it was not merely a spiritual event, but a bodily resurrection, an actual physical rising from the dead. This is critical because it affirms God's intention to redeem the whole person, both body and soul. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Paul calls Christ the first fruits of those who have died, and now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. The term first fruits refers to the first part of a harvest that signals the promise of more to come. 
Christ's resurrection is the guarantee of our own future resurrection. Jesus, as Christ, was raised from the dead, we too shall be raised in due time. The resurrection of Christ is not merely a historical event, but also a promise to believers. The same power that raised Christ from the dead will one day raise all those who belong to him. Paul speaks to this hope in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17. This is the rapture of the church before the tribulation. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a day that will be. This passage emphasizes that those who have died in Christ will rise bodily when he returns in the rapture, that is before the second coming and before the tribulation, and those who are alive will be transformed and taken to be with the Lord forever. Our resurrection is not a disembodied existence, but a physical one, as Jesus' own resurrection was physical. Moreover, in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44, Paul describes the nature of our future resurrected bodies. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Notice the contrast here that Paul makes. Our current bodies are subject to corruption, dishonor, and weakness. But the resurrection, our bodies will be imperishable, glorious, and powerful. Can't wait. <laughs> the term spiritual body does not mean non-physical, but rather a body empowered and sustained by the Holy Spirit fit for eternity. The reality of the resurrection should deeply shape how we live in the present. If we know that death is not the end, but the gateway to eternal life, this gives us hope, courage, and purpose in the midst of life's trials. First, the resurrection gives us hope in suffering. Paul reminds us in Romans 8.18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. No matter the extent of our earthly suffering, we know that a future of unimaginable glory awaits us secured by Christ's resurrection. Second, the resurrection gives us power over sin. In Romans 6, 4, Paul says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The power of the resurrection is not only for the future, but also for the present. Because Christ is risen, we are empowered to live a new life, dead to sin and alive to God. Of course, it's never going to be perfect. We are being sanctified each and every day. We are to choose to walk in the Spirit and stay out of the darkness, right? Finally, the resurrection inspires us to persevere in the work of the Lord. At the conclusion of 1 Corinthians 15, after discussing the resurrection, Paul writes in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Knowing that the resurrection is real, we can work for the kingdom of God with confidence, knowing that our labor has eternal significance. So in conclusion, the doctrine of the resurrection teaches us that Christ's resurrection is the first fruits and guarantee of our own resurrection. Believer's resurrection will be physical, glorious, and incorruptible, fit for eternal life with God. And the hope of the resurrection transforms how we live today, giving us hope, power, and purpose in our Christian walk. Are they there to... Uh wait for the resurrection. Jesus said He would rise from the dead. He said that from the beginning of His ministry, He said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it again. He said that He would be arrested and beaten and crucified and that He would be raised from the dead. Were they there for the resurrection? Well, no. They were there, Mark 16 says, to bring more spices. 
We know that the Jews didn't embalm, there was no exchange of bodily fluids, so corruption was immediate. In fact, when Lazarus had been dead four days, they said there's a stench uh, of the body by that time. That would have been true in the case of any corrupting body over three days. They came purely out of sympathy to anoint the body of Jesus in the grave. This, this was sympathy. This was compassion. And, and you have to believe that this was really agonizing compassion. This was heart-wrenching kind of compassion. They knew that there was a stone over the grave, because it says that in the previous chapter. They didn't know the grave had been sealed with a Roman seal, which meant no one was authorized to break it. They didn't know that the Roman guard had been placed there. So as they began, Mark tells us they were on the way there, they were asking themselves, who will roll the stone away because it is very large? Uh, So they weren't sure at daybreak that there would be any man or men there to help them move the stone. The first emotion then is, is a kind of a crushing, compassionate sympathy mixed with massive disappointment. It would have been wonderful to say that they came because they wanted to sit there until He came out. That wasn't the case. It was just one final act of elevated love to one they so much adored. But their sympathy didn't last very long because it turned immediately into terror. This is the second emotion. Verse 2, behold, there are a lot of beholds. You can scan your eyes down all the way to verse 9 and you'll see behold repeated a number of times. This is one of those behold events. This is a shocking event. So on Friday at the death of Christ, there was a rock-splitting earthquake. Here on Sunday morning, there is another earthquake and the epicenter of this earthquake is the tomb of our Lord Jesus. And as they were walking there, surely they felt the seismic waves extending out of the epicenter of the tomb under their feet as they made their way in that direction. Terror grips them in this situation, not just because of the earthquake, which would have been terrifying in itself, but because the earthquake was the result of an angel of the Lord descending from heaven who came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. An angel descended from heaven. The earthquake was not caused by Jesus leaving the grave, but by the arrival of an angel. It was the earthquake angel. The angel did not come, please notice this, to open the tomb and let Jesus out. By the time the angel arrived to roll the stone away, Jesus had already been gone. Sometimes you see paintings of the resurrection with the stone rolled away and Jesus coming out. That's not true. The angel did not come to let Jesus out. The angel came to roll the stone away to let the eyewitnesses in. Jesus walked through a wall that night when He came to the disciples in the upper room and the door was locked. He didn't need to have the stone rolled away. Nothing in this text indicates that the angel let Jesus out. Everything indicates Jesus had already gone. That's what the angel said. He has risen. He's not here. He doesn't say, I just let Him out. He's right over there. So by the time they arrive, the tomb is now open so they can go in so they can see. The linen clothes lying there, not hastily unwrapped and thrown in a corner, as maybe you might expect, or even more so, if somebody stole the body, they would have taken it wrapped and not unwrapped it and taken a naked, corrupting body. But the grave clothes are lying there in the place that they were when they were on the body as if the body came through the grave clothes. The body part here and the head covering here, and there sat on the stone this angelic witness from heaven. The tomb had been sealed and they had been given a Roman guard to stay there in front of that rock and that stone so that none of His followers could come and steal the body. So what did they say? What did they report had happened? 
Well, it had to be exactly what caused them to fall over in a stupor. They felt an earthquake. They saw the stone rolled away in a blazing being, and they were terrified to the point where they don't remember anything after that. That sounds like something supernatural. They can't allow that. So while these men who thought this was going to be a good day find out it's going to be the worst of days, face this fact they have to do something to fix the problem. And so they all assemble in verse 12, consult, and they decide to give a large sum of money to the soldiers. That's bribery. And they say to them, this is what you say. His disciples came by night and stole Him away while we were asleep. Small question I would have, how do you know that if you were asleep? That story doesn't have any possibility of being believed. So the soldiers took the money, did as they had been instructed, spread a lie that while they were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body, and the story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. To the very day that Matthew was writing, that was the popular legend about what happened. The disciples came and stole the body of Jesus. Well, that's the scene. It's a terrifying, terrifying scene. It was terrifying for the soldiers. It was terrifying for the women. They're standing there in terror. Because in verse 5, the angel says now to the women, the soldiers haven't left yet, they're still in a coma, don't be afraid or stop fearing or fear not, which indicates that they were afraid, they were terrified. Don't be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, the angel says, who has been crucified. Just a a note here, one of the women left, that was Mary Magdalene. As soon as she saw the open tomb, I I think before maybe even the angelic appearance, she bolted. The rest remained. She was on her way back to Peter and John to report that someone had stolen the body. She makes a hasty run back. But the, the rest of the women, they stay and they are given this angelic message, stop being afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. You are looking for Him to, um, to anoint His body. You're not going to find His body. You're not going to be able to put spices on His body. He is not dead. He is not here, for He has risen just as He said. Literally, He was raised. He was raised, an aorist passive. He was raised by God the Father, the New Testament says. He was raised by His own power, the New Testament says. He was raised by the Holy Spirit, the New Testament says all three. This is a fully Trinitarian resurrection. All right, that's going to wrap up this episode here of Narrow Path Doctrine. Thank you so much for joining me today. Be sure to like the video and share it with others. And if you have not subscribed as of yet, what are you waiting for? Click the subscribe button and the notification bell to get updates when new videos like this one come out on the channel. So until next time, remember, true doctrine fuels a living, breathing faith. God bless.